We're here today with uh, Baxter Kruger, and the book is The Shack Revisited. Dynamically uh, received in Brazil and all over the world, correlating to the shack. And uh, Baxter, I want us to cover a lot of ground quickly. So I want to say to you, I've got five spiritual gifts, uh, teaching, evangelism, discernment, leadership, and uh, the fifth one I'm still thinking about. But <laughs> One of them, the, the evangelism, is that the shack has reached a lot of people that are not in the church. Okay? You know that and M I know millions. that. Millions. In a, in a very interesting way. And yet, as we both have discussed, some of the metaphors or the representations of the deity in the shack and other things have caused mainstream evangelical theologians to, to recapitulate and say, you know, we don't like this and, and we've rejected this. And we know the genesis of the shack was a personal crisis in Paul's life. That's right. His wife encouraged him to write it originally for his kids and, and then boom, you know, like it, unique book phenomenons. I mean, there was something here. It took off. I want you, so you, you come back with the shack revisited. First, why? I think that when people read the shack, oh, many people, millions of people read it in tears. Right. And I think it took their uh, breath away. The tagline on my book is, there's more going on here than you ever dared to dream. I think that's what people knew. Somewhere inside they know that God is good and they know that God is beautiful. And that what Paul Young does is he portrays Papa, Jesus, and Saul to you. And, and that relationship is so beautiful and it comes and it embraces Mackenzie in his darkness and pain and hurt. I think when that happens in the shack, I, th I believe every person that read that had a, a hope go up in them. Could that possibly be true for me? Were, so, were these people that were turned off by the rigidness of traditional Christianity or by an austere father? What was the attraction? I mean, the deity, the God is typified by an African woman. Uh, and, you know, again, that's part of the, you know, traditional raising of the eye by some theologians. Well, but they, Jesus portrayed his father as a Jewish patriarch who did the unthinkable, which is run down the road after, a, you know, a son who was a derelict. Right. And so, the, to me, they're, they're choosing an image to try to get around our dragons and our defenses. So is the book a parable? Because Jesus used a lot of parables. We know parables illustrate eternal truths. Is it a parable? I think it's a parable. I think it's a, it's a story that, that I think that what Paul has done is he's found a way to steal behind some of our entrenched prejudices and introduce us to the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit in ways that we can see that we haven't been able to see. And so one issue, one layer there is when you say the name Jesus and I say and this person and that person, there's different things meant. And behind this Jesus, there's a different God. Now, some of us that didn't grow up in homes where our fathers were abusive, we understand Jesus and his father, and this is Jesus reveals the father, and there's no disconnect. But I dare say that millions of people around the world have a huge disconnect sure. between Jesus. No so part of what he's doing and part of what I'm trying to do is say, look, there's no disconnect. This is really the way Jesus' father is. This is the way the Holy Spirit is. So I want to explain that historically and, and biblically. I don't, think, I don't think the early church would have had any problem with the shack. Mm -hmm. I, I think what we're talking about here is modern American or North American evangelicalism. And okay. that's a different thing than... And you've got a PhD from Aberdeen. You studied under really outstanding people. You're a lecturer at Aberdeen. I mean, you can't get any higher qualification than that. So as a theologian, how would you respond to these theologians that you probably would say are being judgmental? They're taking a fiction book Right. And they're, they're spinning it a whole different way. And some, rightfully so, that have never even read it. Yeah, I, I think that if we could, if you can sit down with persons, and I'm not talking about, you know, blogging, and that's so impersonal. And you, but if you sit down with a person and say, okay, let's talk about this. Um, let, let's see, what, what is the sticking point here? Is it because Papa in this book is portrayed as a black woman? Paul Young's not arguing that Papa is a, a, a God the Father is a black woman any more than Jesus was arguing that he's a patriarch, a Jewish patriarch. This is a metaphor, it's a picture to help us maybe encounter something, or not encounter, to see something that we already know. Yeah, and when you approach it that way, fiction, metaphor, you know, I, I, I totally get it, you know, because it does bring out 
emotion. I mean, the shack was a place to ventilate the death of a daughter, a son who almost died. Uh, you know, ex segue that experiential, the maybe experiential theology to the theology that you're teaching clearly in the shack revisit. Here's a great illustration. McKenzie goes back to the shack. He goes in God, G-O-D. Uh, this is the faceless, nameless, omni-being, the God who is largely legalistic, does, is disappointed in us, if not disgusted already. Right. That's his God. Right. Uh, this, I think a lot of people are relating to this. He goes to meet this God. This God's a no-show because this God doesn't exist except in our fallen imaginations. So then he leaves. The last thing he says to this God in the book is, I hate you. I, I'm done. Right. And he leaves. I think people are like, yes, yes, I hate this God. Right. Okay? So then he turns around, he walks out, everything changes, he goes back, and out before he can even knock, the Father, Son, and Spirit figured his Papa, Jesus, and Sada you are already inside the shack. Jesus already has sawdust because he's already preparing for McKenzie's uh, great sadness. And this is while McKenzie is still angry at G-O-D. You with right. me? I this is the, this, I think this is very real. This is who we're angry at this God. We don't want anything to do with this God. And we know it's not real, but we don't have any way of talking about this. Right. So all of a sudden, Papa comes out. How could anybody read that and not to want to be embraced like that? Sure. My point, my segue is that's the gospel. Jesus' Father sent him to find us in the far country, and he's done it. This is who we are. This is not God. This relationship with the Father, Son, and Spirit is the truth, and we're included. Now, come on, walk with us. Change your mind. Change your believing. This is where repentance and faith and all this integrate. Walk with us. We don't know how good this is. We're trying to learn. We're walking together. Let's have a conversation. Let's, let's discuss this. Uh, two things. One, then, would, would you say that for the detractors or the critics that if a disclaimer or putting the word fiction in bold might have helped them understand because we, 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 all, we should add that Paul experienced a tremendous spiritual experience. He's a family man. His family's grown dramatically and you know there, there's a good catharsis that took place personally in his life yeah, reflected I, in the story of the book. I talk about that in my book and, and for me the, the simplest way to talk about that is that Paul Young as a person, as a man, went through a lot of hell in his life. And then he saw something that was so beautiful it took his breath away again and again and again and again. And he didn't have words or the capacity to even begin to talk about mm -hmm. what he had discovered in his pain and darkness, which was the Father, Son, and Spirit. And little by little, this story emerges, which he will tell you uh, he wrote for his children. He, he never intended it for publication. He's trying to help them see and encounter what he saw, and he knows he's outclassed. This is too beautiful for words. Right. This, this, this vision of this Father, Son, and Spirit that actually saved him in his own life and experience is too beautiful. So I read this, his book, and I'm thinking, he knows Jesus' Father. He knows Jesus. He knows the Holy Spirit. And he's found a way to help all of us begin to talk about this in ways that are not going to create division automatically. And that's why you've got 18 million plus. And everybody says that I've talked to in the publishing industry, if you know one book sold is two or three times read. Yeah, I mean, close. you're talking about a bunch of people around the world that are in this conversation. It, could God be this good? We, we live in a damaged world where people are hurting. And you know, we use the little saying, people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And there's a lot of people that feel like nobody cares about the hurt in their life. You come from a background that's uh, pretty intense theologically, <laughs> a five-point tulip Calvinism. That's correct. How did you migrate to this? I mean, from your own personal perspective. I was a senior at the University of Mississippi, and I discovered that we had a library. <laughs> and I went to it, and I checked out a book by Athanasius on the incarnation of the Word of God. There's an edition that's got C.S. Lewis has written the preface to it. Um, I won't go into how I even knew about it, uh, but I, I read that book. And in section six of that little book, Athanasius says, what then was God being good, being good to do when his creation was on the road to ruin and lapsing into non-being? And I suddenly saw that I had, I had always interpreted God's reaction to the fall negatively not in terms of the goodness of God. And so I read a little bit more in Athanasius, and this is another one of his quotes that 
that beautifully rocked my world. He says, the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. So at that point, I'm thinking this is way bigger and way larger. And this is about the character and nature of God the Father. He is for us, not against us. Jesus is not trying to convince. Jesus is the expression of that passion for our, our life and determination that we not perish. So I'm thinking, okay. So that sort of led me to read more widely at the time. I discovered the Torrance brothers in Scotland and T.F. Torrance had retired from teaching in, Ab in uh, Edinburgh. So J.V. Torrance was teaching in, uh, in Aberdeen and I applied and got accepted and I went and I thought, this man knows the same thing Athanasius knows and the same thing that I'm beginning to read in the early church. Those people, those early, the early church, they saw Jesus as the, as the one who holds the entire creation together in himself and he's the one that's in the Father. This was blowing their minds. This is so beautiful and so good. And I think we've gotten a little bit distracted over here in some of our legalities. And so when you have this revelation of this relationship, it may reveal that we're on a rabbit trail. Right. And it's okay because we can come back into the conversation. We so. do know that God is working in apostolic ways all over the world. It doesn't fit in little theological boxes. I mentioned to you that uh, a peer of mine at, at the Divinity College I graduated from uh, serving in Beirut, said that Muslims are coming to Christ. And I asked him how, and he said, Jerry, you're not going to believe this. He said, Jesus is actually revealing himself to them in visions and dreams. Now, the normal cut and dried theologian would say, Where, what, what's the chapter and verse? But the fact is that is happening and God works. So, well, wait, 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 the normal cut and dry theologian of which particular tradition? Because I think Athanasius and the early church would have said, well, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course he's revealing himself to you in dreams. And he's revealing himself to you. And if you believe in him and he hasn't revealed himself to you, then what are you believing in? Right. So it was about relationship with a person. And I think, so there's different places in history where that, that would sit differently with different theologians. Madame Gan, you know, had a spiritual mysticism about her, and J. Hudson Taylor in China had a spiritual mysticism. So did David Livingston. I mean, these people we quote all the time that were like the, uh, you know, the, the mavericks of missionology. Is the shack something of uh, 21st century spiritual mysticism that has an undercurrent of theological thoughts or redemption maybe? I, I, I do not personally like the word mysticism in, in our time. And why is that? Um, I think, um, I think the, the, the concept of Christ's union with us and our union with him that you see in John's gospel, right. for example, that Jesus says in that day, you will know that I am in my father and, and you're in me and I'm in you. Uh, I think that's the heart of the New Testament. You could call that mysticism. What word would you use that would be more accurate? Well, you could uh, union, relationship, mm -hmm. right. uh, koinonia, perichoresis, koinonia. which means oneness without law. I mean, yeah. uh, mysticism, it may work for some people. Just for me, it sounds like that's like it has no thought to it. Yeah, sure. It's got no content. It's just sort of an experience thing. And I may be wrong about it. Because to me, it's, uh, I see that, that verse, John 14, 20. Jesus is saying, look away from yourself. See me in the Father, not with the Father. It's the relationship that he has is so deep and beautiful. He's actually in the Father and the Father's in him. And he's saying, hello, boys. I'm way bigger than you think I am because I've already got you with me in the Father. And then I'm already at work within you. And so you begin to discover more about who you are as a human being in Christ. And that's, I mean, that's the gospel message is that this is who we are. This is what Jesus has made of us. And now we can begin to discover who, what's really going on here. So that, that is, people call me mystical because I talk about union with Christ. Right. But it's really about discovering that Jesus has a relationship with me. But the deeper life is yeah. union. Yeah, it is I union. I mean, J. Hudson Taylor talked about the exchange life. It's exactly, and he well, said it, that was the turning point. And John Calvin talked about the wonderful exchange, which goes back to the early church. He got that from the early church where he sees like, like when Paul says in, the, in the, uh, second Corinthians, he says, for, you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. And I think Paul's thinking about eternal relationship with the father. He became poor that we through his poverty might be made wealthy, rich with his richness. And he says, this is Jesus comes to give us his peace his joy, that the love with which you loved me before the foundation of the world may be in them and I in them. 
Now, that, if that's mysticism, I'm all in. But right. that sounds like relationship and union to me. Yeah. Um, talk about for a moment the impact of the shack revisited and the shack in the redemption of people coming to faith. Well, you, you mentioned evangelistic earlier and we kind of went a different way with it. And I wanted to come back to that with respect to the shack because it opens people's hearts to, wait a minute, you mean Jesus' Father is not like this? It might be like this. So I, I piggyback on that and say, uh, in, in the very beginning, uh, uh, early on in the book, and I say, yes. Yes, Jesus' Father is this way. He's, he's better than we thought. We can count on His goodness towards us. That's what we can believe in. We can believe that He's good all the time towards us. And Jesus is the proof. So there's that evangelistic thing that goes to me. is like we, in one way, we're helping people move out of one uh, bad theology, Athanasius right. would call it mythology, to see the truth. Well, that in itself is, is making people sit up. Like, wait a minute, I want to know more about this. I want to know more about this conversation. So when Paul and I have the chance to travel, that's, and, I, and he's doing part of his speaking, and I have the privilege of sitting there and looking at people's faces, it's like, oh, yeah, I know that's true. And that's the, that's the consistent comment that I get all over in my travels is Baxter, you're not telling me anything I didn't know. I've just never had anybody put it into words. Is there a balance you bring as a theologian to Paul? I mean, I, there's one thing to go to a Bible college. It's another thing to do what you've done academically. I mean, it, does it bring a balance? Balance, balance may be a good word. I think, I, think, um, I think Paul understands our inner worlds and the damage that's done in our childhood and how that affects uh, all the relationships and all. He's, a, he's the master of helping us enter into that. And so I think I bring some historical stuff. I think I come to him and say, look, read this in John Calvin. You yeah. know, look, look at what Calvin actually right. says about union with Christ. Right. It's right there in the great reformer. Right. You know, read this here. And so I'm, I bring a, a historical perspective. Um, I think some theological depth and clarity to it. So in that sense, it works really well uh, together, his book, my book, the two of us when we're talking or teaching together. Uh, just in the final moments, Tom Rainier has pointed out that one of the reasons why people leave the faith is personal disappointment. And almost all of them have had some real personal disappointment. Grandpa died, somebody got cancer, somebody turned me off at the church, my wife or husband left me. How does your book reach out to those that are disappointed and you know for those of us who have hurt personally mm. one lesson I've learned is not to be judgmental I, 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 I personally have a real distaste for anyone who'll get up and talk about another minister and try to tear them down who doesn't go and see them personally one-on-one -on -one first and, and yeah and reach out and even when we correct you know we're known by our love not by our hate how does your book reach out to those that have been disappointed and hurt I think it confirms for them that God is different than they have been taught, perhaps. And I think it gives them hope. And I think, uh, like I say sometimes, most of our prayers, we pray to a God we think is not interested in what we really want. And we got to find a way by, you know, intensity or whatever to get him to do what. And I said, I think people read my book, they, I think they will begin to think that the Father, Son, and Spirit is already involved in my life everywhere. And instead of praying to ask uh, God to be involved, I can begin to see how the Father, Son, and Spirit are with me, in me, and look for the presence of the Holy Spirit in every situation. The Holy Spirit is a redeeming genius, takes up murder, takes up a, a murdered son on a cross and turns it into the greatest victory in the universe. We, we can, I think my book helps you go, you mean I can, that's going on in my life? And I can look for that. And, and so I can grab your hand and say, we're going to look for it today because it certainly doesn't look like it. You know, it doesn't look like the Holy Spirit's doing it, but we can begin to see that together. It gives yeah. us new eyes. And there is an emotion to our faith, is there not? I Absolutely. mean, I have an emotion with my wife. I'm in love with her. God's in love with me. We've got an emotional capacity right. to this whole thing. We've been talking to Baxter Kruger, and the book is The Shack Revisited. And we just want to thank you for your thoughts and uh, may God make yeah. us all one as we move forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me.